my dear parishioners, for our topic this evening, we'll just simply speak about St. Louis Marie de Montfort's booklet, Friends of the Cross. If you've never read it, this really is a must read for traditional Catholics of our time. It would seem that St. Louis Marie de Montfort had two particular loves in his life, I guess we could say, devotions, uh, that, that set him apart really from even other saints. One, of course, was Our Blessed Mother, total consecration in there, his wonderful book on true devotion. But the other was his love of the cross. And what's unique about this is I have never come across any book in ascetical theology, the spiritual life, that is on the cross the way this is. Now, he doesn't call it a book. It's a very uh, short booklet. But he calls it a letter to the friends of the cross. And of course, St. Louis Marie Monica was a domestic missionary in northwestern France where he traveled around from diocese to diocese, parish to parish, and gave parish missions. But he had enemies who were always trying to undermine his work. And they were Jansenists, or at least influenced by Jansenistic ideas, Jansenistic teaching. And they looked down upon piety, processions, things of that nature, and they particularly detested him. And so on one occasion, and this probably wasn't the only one, there was a mission set up, the bishop of the diocese approved it, everything was set. When he got there, he was told the bishop changed his mind and he was forbidden to preach in that diocese. Well, his enemies got to the bishop, undermined him. And so, he had already traveled, he couldn't just turn around and go back. He decided he would make a retreat. And during that retreat, he wrote this booklet, what he calls his letter to the Friends of the Cross. He was forbidden to preach, but he wasn't forbidden to write to the Catholics. And again, it's a wonderful booklet that brings out the value of the cross. He starts off by talking about the fact that there are two roads, we might say, in life. Remember how the apostles asked our Lord once, are few saved? And he didn't answer the question directly. He said, strive to enter by the narrow gate. For wide, wide is the way, broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many there are who go that way. How narrow the gate and straight the light, straight the way that leads to life, and few there are who find it. So taking up that idea, St. Louis says there really are two paths. It would be one would be the path of following our Lord on his way to Calvary, carrying our cross, following Christ, renouncing the world and the spirit of the world, and following our Lord. And the other would be following the world. So in other words, there are many Catholics, likely, who are not on the right path. They're more of the world and seeking pleasure and amusement. While those who follow Christ, their focus, their goal is getting to heaven and carrying their cross, mortifying themselves, observing the commandments, and so forth. And then he goes into what he calls the 14 rules for carrying one's cross. And it would be good to read them. I thought I might this evening paraphrase them, but then I changed my mind because I thought that would probably draw this out too long. But I would mention a few of them. One of them, he says, don't go after, don't create crosses. Don't try and do something poorly just to bring discredit on yourself so that you have a cross to carry. Do your daily duties, do them well, do what is expected of you, and the crosses will come. You don't have to go and make some for yourself. They will be there. The important thing is to accept them when they come. Another rule, he talks about not trying to do some extraordinary thing. Sometimes we can read the lives of the saints and we reflect upon certain things they did that are heroic, almost inhuman. How could they do that? How could they live like that? And he says, you don't have to do that, but just carrying your cross all the little things of every day, doing God's will every day, and you're, you're adding up. All these little things add up to something very wonderful. He also talks about calling to mind four things. And he says they are the eye of God, the hand of God, 
the happiness of heaven, and the torments of hell. So those are four things you should think about. So what does he mean by the eye of God? He says, think about a soldier that's fighting a battle, and his general is on a hill looking down as his soldiers are engaging the battle. And he fights harder because he thinks my general is watching me. I want to prove that I'm valiant. And so God beholds us, carrying our cross, struggling with our daily trials and so forth. So remember the eye of God. What about the hand of God? That means that ultimately, Almighty God is behind, by his permission, all the crosses that come our way. He does not cause them because God does not cause evil, if it is an evil, the particular cross. But he allows it. He permits it. He's permissive will. So he says from that standpoint, think of the hand of God, that God is behind the crosses that come to us. Third, think about the happiness of heaven, that by carrying my cross, I am earning merit. And this life is so short. And to look forward to the happiness of heaven. And of course, also to think about the punishment of hell for those who reject the cross and not only refuse to carry the cross, but ultimately live lives of sin. So he says those are four things to consider. But as I mentioned, there are actually 14 of these rules, and it would be good to read them. He takes the quote of our Lord, if thou wilt be my disciple, deny thyself, take up thy cross and follow me, and he spends paragraphs explaining that word for word, phrase for phrase. So it is important to reflect upon. But one last thought I want to mention is a little poem in this. And it's interesting because we have this required reading for our juniors. And when they do a book report on it, they usually all comment on this. And it's something that I remember, uh, you know, by heart. It's a little poetic phrase, just to mark the one stanza. And it goes like this. He says, three crosses stand on Calvary's height. One must be chosen, so choose a right. Like a saint you must suffer, or a penitent thief, or like a reprobate in endless grief. And it's really a clever little poem that brings out a very profound truth. And that is, everybody has to suffer. Whether we want to or not, we have to suffer. Now, those especially who are in the healthcare profession are aware of the fact that there are many people in hospitals or suffering who are angry, who are not resigned at all to their suffering, and they're wasting the suffering. They're angry at God. They complain, etc. It's a lot of wasted suffering in the world. So we all are going to suffer in different ways at different times in our lives. How do we carry that cross? We could be like our Lord. The, the, the middle cross, of course, our Lord, the saint of saints, reminding us that the great saint of the cross, and we look in the lives of the saints, and they even wanted to suffer because their love for God was so much they wanted to suffer. They wouldn't say they enjoyed it, but they chose it because they knew its value. They would be like our Lord in the middle. Well, to our Lord's right was the penitent thief. And he knew that he deserved his punishment, his death, his execution for his crimes. He even said to his companion on the other side of our Lord, he said, we suffer justly for our deeds, but this man has done no evil. So our Lord's example turned him to the point where he died penitent and accepted with resignation, his, his death, his sufferings. So that second cross would symbolize those who don't want to suffer, but they accept it at, in resignation to God's will. But then the third cross, of course, of the impenitent thief would signify those who reject the cross. They are angry, they don't bear the cross, at least with patience and striving for resignation. They, they reject it. They're angry at God and end up going from the frying pan into the fire, literally, from the sufferings of this life to everlasting suffering because they fail to realize the value of the cross and they reject the cross and they lose all the merit that they could gain. So during Lent, 
as we take upon ourselves various penances and sacrifices. Let's reflect a little bit on the value of the cross. Our Lord chose to suffer. And as St. Louis says, if there was anything better, more perfect, better for our salvation, he would have done it. But he chose the cross. He chose the suffering. And he wants us to be united with him. If thou wilt be my disciple, deny thyself, take up thy cross, and follow me. And so this is really the path of a true Christian. And one last thought is St. Louis says, can you imagine the incongruity of a head crowned with thorns and suffering, but the members of the body are resting on pillows, wanting to be comfortable. And he's, of course, talking about the mystical body of Christ. Christ is the head of his mystical body. We are the members. And if he who is our head suffered, suffered throughout his life and died on the cross, can we choose a different path? The disciple is not above his master. We must imitate him. We must carry our cross because he is our path to heaven.